You're looking at a depiction of the lithograph print, Relativity, by the artist M.C. Escher. Like many of his pieces of work, Escher plays with aspects of reality, in which the inhabitants of the painting coexist in different gravitational realms, creating a confusing collage that is difficult to visualize in three-dimensional space. Unfortunately, anatomy students often feel the same way when they first consider the infratemporal fossa. It's a small space located deep to the ramus of the mandible, with sloping boundaries and structures running at various oblique angles, which makes it a challenge to properly represent with two-dimensional images. And to add to this complexity, there's a space within this space known as the pterygopalatine fossa, which contains some of the most complex neuroconductions in the body. We'll try to demystify these complexities in our discussion of the infratemporal fossa. Good day and welcome to this video lecture on the infratemporal fossa. As the name suggests, it's the region of face found just below and continuous with the temporal region that we just discussed. It's a relatively small space, but has a complex organization of vascular branches running medially from off the external carotid artery and nerve branches running anterolaterally from off the trigeminal nerve. All of this packed within a dense bed of muscle tissue responsible for chewing. Oh, and I almost forgot, there's a small closet on the back wall of the infratemporal fossa called the pterygopalatine fossa. It's still part of the infratemporal fossa, but represents its own closed off space, much like the closet in your bedroom. This fossa contains complex nerve branches and communicates with the orbit, nasal, oral, and cranial cavities through small foraminal channels. Not surprising that this region gives students so many difficulties when they first encounter it. We'll approach this challenge by first describing the specific borders of the infratemporal fossa to define this region. We'll then discuss the muscles of mastication, or chewing, looking at their attachments and specific actions. We'll then continue on with the neurovasculature within this region and finish things off with a specific look at the complex neural components of the pterygopalatine fossa. The infratemporal fossa is a small, irregularly shaped cavity just inferior to the temporal region and deep to the zygomatic arch and ramus of the mandible, which defines its lateral most borders. The temporal and sphenoid bones make up most of the medial bony wall of the infratemporal fossa and taper both superiorly and posteriorly, resulting in a wedge-shaped superior and posterior border for this space. The sphenoid communicates with the maxillary bone anteriorly, where its infratemporal surface and zygomatic process define the anterior border. On a dry skull, the inferior margin of the fossa is open and continuous with the region associated with the oral cavity. When the soft tissue is in place, the superior surface of the medial pterygoid muscle defines the inferior limits of the infratemporal fossa. Time to look at some of the contents of the infratemporal fossa, starting with the muscles of mastication. Mastication is a fancy medical name for chewing and in this case is used to describe four distinct muscles found in and around the infratemporal fossa, which are all innervated by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. The temporalis muscle is one you should already be familiar with. Its broad origin off the temporal bone is associated with the temporal region, but its tendon projects inferiorly into the infratemporal fossa to insert on the coronoid process of the mandible. When the fibers contract, the muscle pulls superiorly on the coronoid process, elevating the mandible to close the jaw. The masseter muscle serves a similar function. In this case, the muscle originates off both the superficial and mastication is a fancy medical name for chewing, and in this case is used to describe four distinct muscles found in and around the infratemporal fossa, which are all innervated by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve.
The temporalis muscle is one you should already be familiar with. Its broad origin off the temporal bone is associated with the temporal region, but its tendon projects inferiorly into the infratemporal fossa to insert on the coronoid process of the mandible. When the fibers contract, the muscle pulls superiorly on the coronoid process, elevating the mandible to close the jaw. The masseter muscle serves a similar function. In this case, the muscle originates off both the superficial and deep surfaces of the zygomatic arch, with the fibers projecting inferiorly to insert broadly on the external surface of the ramus of the mandible. So again, as with the temporalis muscle, the majority of the muscle is found just outside the infratemporal fossa. And also as with the temporalis muscle, contraction of the masseter serves to elevate the mandible and close the jaw. The masseter is easily observed and palpated through surface anatomy, particularly when the jaw is clenched shut. The third muscle to discuss is the lateral pterygoid. This one is much trickier to conceptualize. It lies deep in the infratemporal fossa and is difficult to represent using two-dimensional images. This is actually a bicipital muscle with fibers originating off the inferior surface of the sphenoid bone as well as the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. These fibers converge to insert on the medial surface of the condyloid process of the mandible. The function of this muscle is a little unique. When both sides contract, it serves to pull the condyloid processes anteriorly and slightly inferior, causing protrusion and depression of the mandible. This makes it the only muscle of mastication to assist in opening the jaw. Inferior to the lateral pterygoid is the medial pterygoid muscle. This is another bicipital muscle originating off the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate, as well as the palatine bone. The heads converge on the internal surface of the ramus of the mandible, just opposite to the masseter muscle. As you might expect from the direction of pull, the medial pterygoid also assists in closing the jaw. In addition to their roles in opening and closing the jaws, the pterygoid muscles also play a role in side-to-side -side motions of the mandible. Both muscles originate off the cranial base close to the mid-sagittal line and insert laterally on the mandible. As a result, unilateral contraction of these muscles pulls the ipsilateral ramus of the mandible towards the midline, resulting in the movement of the mandible to the contralateral side. So for example, if you contract the right pterygoid muscles, the entire mandible will shift to the left, and vice versa. The muscles of mastication are typically used in eating and speaking, but can also be activated at a subconscious level, which can result in bruxism or teeth grinding. This can happen during waking hours in which the condition is attributed to stress and anxiety. The condition can also happen during sleep, which is more commonly associated with sleep disturbances. In either case, chronic unresolved bruxism can result in dental attrition or tooth wear. For this reason, a dental mouth guard is often employed at night to minimize tooth wear associated with nocturnal bruxism. The principal blood supply to the infratemporal fossa stems from the maxillary artery, one of two terminal branches of the external carotid artery. The artery appears deep to the neck of the mandible. From here, it takes a tortuous route, running medially, then anteriorly, then medially again to reach the pterygopalatine fossa and continue into the nasal cavity. For descriptive purposes, the artery can be subdivided into three regions as it passes through the infratemporal fossa. The first segment is referred to as the mandibular portion, as the artery first arises and passes medially along the inferior border of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Two smaller branches, not seen in this image, the deep auricular and anterior tympanic arteries, pierce the undersurface of the cranial vault laterally to supply the temporal mandibular joint and tympanic membrane. The more prominent middle meningeal artery will also pierce the cranial vault through the foramen spinosum, running along the underside of the cranium to nourish the bone and dura mater. As will be discussed in a later session, skull fractures may damage this important vessel, leading to serious cranial bleeds. Just distal to the middle meningeal artery, 
the inferior alveolar artery projects inferiorly, passing through the mandibular foramen to supply the bone and teeth of the lower jaw. The artery emerges once again through the mental foramen to supply vasculature to the chin. The second segment of the maxillary artery is referred to as the pterygoid portion. This is the part of the artery that runs anterior and superior towards the pterygopalatine fossa. It contains a number of muscular branches that supply the muscles of mastication, including the masseteric artery and deep temporal branches that supply the temporalis muscle. The buccal artery also arises in this region, supplying the internal mucosa of the cheek and buccinator muscle. The pterygomaxillary portion is the terminal segment of the maxillary artery, which projects into the pterygopalatine fossa. The posterior superior alveolar artery pierces the posterior surface of the maxilla, then divides into numerous branches that supply the molars and premolars, as well as the posterior aspect of the maxillary sinus. The infraorbital artery courses through the infraorbital foramen, where it supplies the superior portion of the maxillary sinus as well as the inferior portion of the orbit. It then continues anteriorly, dividing into middle and anterior superior alveolar arteries that supply the anterior upper dentition. The descending palatine artery projects inferiorly, where it splits into greater and lesser palatine branches that enter the roof of the oral cavity to supply the hard and soft palate, respectively. An additional branch, known as the artery of the pterygoid canal, projects posteriorly to supply intracranial structures and the upper portion of the pharynx. The terminal portion of the maxillary artery passes medially through the sphenopalatine foramen within the medial wall of the pterygopalatine fossa to enter the nasal cavity. From here, the sphenopalatine artery, as it's called, splits into posterior lateral branches which run inferiorly within the lateral nasal mucosa and septal branches that run superiorly over the arch of the nasal cavity, then inferiorly to supply the nasal septum. The main neural component of the infratemporal fossa is the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. The main stem of the trigeminal nerve branch emerges in the infratemporal fossa through the foraminal valley located in the floor of the cranium, where small branches come off to supply the meninges and muscles of the middle ear chamber. The trigeminal nerve will almost immediately split into two principal divisions. The anterior division supplies the motor branches to the muscles of mastication, including the deep temporal nerve shown here, as well as a sensory buccal branch that supplies the mucosa along the cheek. The posterior branch gives off three major divisions. The auriculotemporal nerve branches as two separate roots that once again fuse after encircling the middle meningeal artery. It then emerges superficially behind the neck of the mandible and runs superiorly to provide sensation to the skin in front of the ear. As we'll see in our discussion of the cranial nerves, it also carries parasympathetic innervation originating from the glossopharyngeal nerve to the parotid gland to stimulate salivation. The second branch is the lingual nerve, which runs antero-inferiorly to the base of the tongue to provide general sensation to the anterior two-thirds of this organ. So anytime you bite or burn your tongue, the pain sensation is picked up by the lingual nerve. In addition, the lingual nerve also accepts a small but important branch originating from the facial nerve called the chordae tympani. This is responsible for the special sense of taste, again from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, as well as parasympathetic innervation to the submandibular and sublingual glands to stimulate salivation. The last principal branch off the posterior division is the inferior alveolar nerve. This branch passes into the mandibular foramen along with the inferior alveolar artery and supplies sensory innervation to the same structures of the lower jaw. It also gives off a single motor branch to the mylohyoid muscle, which comes off just before the nerve enters the mandibular foramen and runs deep to the mandible 
to reach the mylohyoid muscle. The inferior alveolar nerve is the target of nerve block injections, just proximal to the point at which it enters the mandibular foramen. This effectively anesthetizes the entire lower jaw on the side of the injection for any sort of dental work that needs to be done. When you were a small child, you might have been frightened by the thought of monsters in your bedroom closet. Similarly, many first-year anatomy students are frightened by the contents of the closet we are about to discuss. The pterygopalatine fossa is an impression along the medial wall of the infratemporal fossa that can be thought of as a subspace within this region. Putting it another way, if the infratemporal fossa is a bedroom space, the pterygopalatine fossa would be the closet along the back wall of this bedroom. So let's step into the closet and have a look around. Just as a standard closet has a ceiling, floor, a back wall, and two side walls, so does the pterygopalatine fossa. The only difference is that several of these walls have small foramen in them that allow for structures to pass into other regions of the skull. The anterior wall is the continuation of the infratemporal surface of the maxilla, which also makes up the anterior wall of the whole infratemporal fossa. In the pterygopalatine fossa, the inferior orbital fissure opens into the anterior wall, allowing neurovascular structures to pass from the pterygopalatine fossa to the face, between the orbit of the eye and the maxillary sinus. Opposite the anterior wall, the posterior wall is made up of the pterygoid processes and greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Two important foramen allow for communication between the pterygopalatine fossa and the cranial cavity. One is the foramen rotundum, which encases the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. Inferior to this is the much smaller pterygoid canal, which is still often referred to by its previous name, the Vidian Canal. As we shall see in our discussion of the cranial nerves, this channel carries sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers that supply the nasal cavity, roof of the mouth, and some contents within the orbit. The medial wall represents the back of the closet and is formed by the perpendicular plates of the palatine bone. Here we find the sphenopalatine foramen, an opening which allows for the passage of neurovascular structures into the nasal cavity. The floor of the pterygopalatine fossa is formed by the pyramidal processes of the palatine bone. It communicates with the oral cavity through greater and lesser palatine canals. The lateral margin is the opening into the closet, which allows communication with the much larger infratemporal fossa. The main component of the pterygopalatine fossa is the pterygopalatine ganglion. It should be noted that some older textbooks will refer to this as the sphenopalatine ganglion, in case you come across the term. It contains cell bodies for postganglionic parasympathetic neurons that travel throughout the head. In addition, it also serves as a convergence point for sympathetic innervation, as well as general somatic sensation, which then spread out to different destinations. You can think of the pterygopalatine ganglion as being like a major airport terminal, like O'Hare Airport, which provides connector flights to numerous destinations. So if I board a plane here in Buffalo with the intention of flying out to Portland, for example, I'll be on the plane with a number of other Buffalonians traveling together to Chicago to catch flights to a variety of destinations like Miami, New Orleans, Las Vegas, and so forth. Once I get to O'Hare, I'll board another plane bound for Portland, along with travelers from other regions of the country. In this case, we all come from different places, but have the same destination in mind. This is how the pterygopalatine ganglion works. Autonomics enter the ganglion from the nerve of the pterygoid canal, which we will see is itself a combination of the fusion of parasympathetics from the greater petrosal nerve with sympathetics from the deep petrosal nerve. Somatic sensory enters the ganglion from pterygopalatine branches 
projecting inferiorly from the maxillary branch of trigeminal nerve. At this point, sensory and autonomic branches make their connector flights, diverging and converging so that mixed branches can travel to various regions of the head. For example, the nasopalatine branch brings autonomics and general sensation to the nasal cavity, while the greater and lesser palatine nerves brings autonomics and general sensation to the roof of the oral cavity. An additional branch projects into the maxillary branch and ultimately the ophthalmic branch of trigeminal nerve to bring autonomics to the lacrimal gland of the eye. That's going to do it for our discussion of the infratemporal fossa. Next up, we'll pop the top to take a look at the cranial fossa. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. You know the rest.